We were deep into a defense review. We were still debating how much intervention was wise, the utility of land power, and we were making our case for the centrality of the British Maneuver Division. Well, 2015 almost feels like another country. Let me also extend my thanks to everybody else here this morning. The hall is much fuller than it was three years ago. And I'd like to extend a particular welcome to my fellow Army Chiefs of Staff and their representatives. As Karen has said, 43 nations we think represented here this morning. That's a near unique military gathering in London. And I think that's the first important point I would like to make. We're all here together, committed military partners and allies, sharing a common goal for peace, stability, coherent deterrence, in a world in which consensus and partnership seems an increasingly precious commodity. And perhaps it reflects a growing recognition of our responsibility as committed military professionals to retain our sense of unity and purpose at a juncture in our respective national histories when the political and the diplomatic unity of governments is under enormous pressure. When the definition of a common global strategy looks increasingly elusive. And any crack in the unity of democratic nations is ruthlessly exploited to the detriment of our own security and our defense cooperation. So it's not just important that we're all here today and tomorrow. I think I would go further and say that it's vital to our own respective nation's security. And it sends a powerful message to our potential adversaries. But now that we are here, I hope you'll all contribute to the debate around our unifying theme of maneuver. Because we've all got to think much more clearly about how the geometry of the battle space is going to change. The traditional and the non-traditional, how the man-made domains relate to the environmental, and the extent to which continuities exist. Because, of course, maneuver has never been limited literally to the physical. And where there are discontinuities, literally breaks with the past, how they'll demand new ways of thinking and new ways of operating with everything that that sort of revolution entails. Because to my mind, I think there are some inescapable realities. The first is the rapidly expanding scope and transparency of the battle space. Maneuver itself no longer bound by the natural environment and the laws of physics. The proliferation of nuclear and conventional ballistic missiles. The realities of chemical and biological warfare. Longer range precision attack. Advanced area and access denial. The real advent of cyber warfare. A man-made domain, unconstrained by geography, and of near unlimited scope, unlimited reach and tempo, net speed, inherently asymmetric, spontaneous, and unattributable. I, for a long time, have wondered if we haven't already suffered our cyber 9-11, but simply don't yet know it. And, of course, the inexorable growth of technical intrusion, 
Taken together, it's no less than a permanent and an escalating technical transformation where revolution is the new evolution. And the information age is rapidly dissolving yesterday's boundaries. The distinctions between fact or fiction, domestic and international, overt and covert, real or virtual, is that now one and the same thing? Even, of course, the distinction between peace and conflict at its most extreme. And the use of war and victory as a lens through which to gauge the utility of the military instrument and of our armed forces no longer seems so helpful. But of course, as these traditional boundaries disappear, fresh horizons and new domains open up. And it's the implications of these changes that I think we need to concentrate on during the course of this conference. Because as the cycle of competition hots up and the pace of change accelerates, how do we avoid falling behind? How do we transition from a legacy of equipment and method rooted in the evolution of our armed forces from the fixed algebra of the Cold War, the high watermark of our doctrine along the inner German border? and latterly the contemporary fascination with counterinsurgency and today's zeitgeist of counterterrorism as the sum of our national security. How do we regain the operational advantage through the potential of the information age, exploiting technological innovation to establish a credible asymmetric advantage over our potential adversaries? I'm interested in how we exploit the emerging opportunities in autonomy, robotics, and artificial intelligence, the advances in range, precision, and the stealth of our platforms, our munitions, and our sensors, and the exponential power and growth of connectivity, processing, ubiquitous information, data, and its rapid exploitation. Our challenge is to understand, decide, act, and adapt faster, faster than our most capable adversaries. And whilst warfare at its most fundamental remains unchanged in nature, violent and visceral, a lethal contest of wills, the images from Raqqa and Mosul speak to that. It's hard to imagine that the application of these technologies isn't going to profoundly change some of its characteristics, increasing its scope, its breadth, its speed, and the range of opportunities well beyond the contours of geography and the laws of physics, which traditionally might have been assumed the parameters of land effect. Might technology eventually trump terrain? Well, not today to my mind, but I wouldn't bank on it in the future. Certainly if we don't understand it, or we fail to think through the consequences, then war and war's derivatives have a future. Because put simply, they happen when the people who start them think that they're going to win. And in an era of heightened tension and increased strategic vulnerability, when potentially existential threats can manifest themselves unattributably and at the speed of the net, the threat of miscalculation is only rising. Let me just finish with a word on house rules because we're all in a very dense electronic warfare environment in this hall for the next day and a half. As Karen has said, we're live streaming across the Army's base locations to expand the conversation and the debate.
to those who can't be here. And we're being followed across several army social media forums, not necessarily new to many of you, but certainly new to me. The Wavell Room, Brain and the Dragon Portal, to name but three. And it's through these portals that tomorrow's generation of leaders are going to be critiquing our performance. And I hope at the same time adding some energy and momentum to the debate as to how warfare either is or is not changing in this mis- and disinformation age. So let me conclude by saying how grateful I am to see this hall this morning quite as full as it is. We've got some fascinating and some important ground to cover, and I would urge you all to contribute in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. And I'll speak again tomorrow afternoon to draw some concluding comments and speak rather more expansively about what my ambition for the British Army is going to be. I'll now hand over to Lord Haig, who's going to lead us on a tour de raison, a broad sweep, I think we agreed, of the strategic context as seen from his very personal perspective. Uh, well, <clears throat> Karen, CGS, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure as chairman of RUSI to welcome you all here this morning. This is one of the most important events in our calendar each year. We are, as you heard from Karen, one of the leading think tanks in the world on security and defense matters, and our job is to encourage thinking that is fresh, that is well-informed, that is independent, that is unconstrained by conventional wisdom or having to take place in the office. Um, and I hope you will all enjoy that at this conference over the next two days. Uh, our original founder, the Duke of Wellington, one of the greatest generals of all time, at least from the British uh, point of view, um, <laughs> illustrated very well the, the difference between military and political leadership a lot of the time. Uh, he's an unusual case in British history because he's a case where we made a successful general prime minister, uh, something that's very rare uh, in British history, much rarer than in the United States, for instance. Um, but he chaired his first cabinet meeting as prime minister, and they asked him afterwards how it had gone, and he said it was absolutely extraordinary. He said, I gave them their orders, and they all started discussing them. Uh, and he had, he had not really come across that before. <laughs> um, so at this meeting, you are meant to discuss those things. Uh, military people are meant to discuss those things as freely as possible, and I hope you will find it thought-provoking and productive. And I join in wishing well to our new Chief of the General Staff. I left government three years ago, which turned out to be a very good time to leave government in the United <laughs> Kingdom. Uh, everything was running fine when I left. <laughs> and I left government three years ago, so I'm not up to date in daily contact with um, uh, military leaders behind the scenes in British government. Uh, but I did, on, on several difficult situations, uh, work with the new CGS in his previous role, and I witnessed the wisdom and the experience and the cool head and clear mind that he brought to those situations. And so I congratulate him on his uh, promotion and selection to this role and wish him well in it. Um, I am going to talk uh, for a short time about the overall strategic context this is a world which is making unparalleled progress, but in which political risk and fragmentation is rising. And it's very important before we <clears throat> go through some of the risks to acknowledge the progress. If you are going to choose any time to be alive in history as a human being, you would almost certainly choose now in terms of lifespan, health, security, prosperity. We are at the first moment in human history where statistically, not only us, but the average human being is more likely to die from eating too much than from eating too little. Remember that before you have your lunch uh, later today. 
Uh, as one of the great commentators on our times, Yuval Noah Harari, has observed, three times as many people now die each year from diabetes than from all forms of violence, including war, terrorism, and crime. So as he puts it, sugar is now much more dangerous than gunpowder to the average human being. Uh, and that trend, that positive trend in lifespan, security, has been accelerated by the great changes of our lifetimes. If we want to simplify the history of our own lifetimes so far, we would really say that three things have happened. Now, the Cold War has come to an end. Information technology has started to revolutionize economies, societies, and so many other activities, including military activities. And China has undertaken a massive and extraordinary rise in world affairs, particularly in the world economy. And those three things, the end of the Cold War, the advent of information technology, um, and the rise of China, add up to what we call globalization. And that globalization has, as it turns out, not brought about the triumph of a single system of government or society, as was often imagined in the 1990s. It has not brought universal liberal democracy. It has not brought a consensus on how new problems, such as increased migration or climate change, should be tackled, or a common understanding of how to conduct world affairs. And so a good deal of the optimism of the 1990s uh, at the end of the Cold War has not been <clears throat> justified. We have not reached the end of history, but now embarked on a new period, it seems, of unpredictability in which states and others maneuver for advantage in new ways, which others then find threatening. And a clear example, of course, of that, and one that I dealt with a lot in my years as Foreign Secretary of the UK, is relations between the West and Russia. Those relations were excellent for a time in the 1990s. The Cold War had ended, Russia was admitted to the G7 that became the G8, business and economic links were encouraged. As far as the Western countries were concerned, the expansion of the European Union and NATO uh, it, to the east was not a threat to Russia. It was not intended as a threat. Russia would become just like us, with the same strategic perspective. Uh, there was no need for a strategic difference or for anyone to feel threatened. And so in the 1990s, a vast misunderstanding arose between the West and Russia, and it is the origin of so many of the tensions and conflicts uh, between us today. Uh, the expansion of Euro-Atlantic institutions and Western democracy eastwards seemed natural to Western uh, countries, including the UK and France and the United States and Germany, um, but to Russia, which took a different path from our version of liberal democracy and has not changed the way of thinking of a large, of a country, a vast country with long land borders that have been invaded many times over the last two or three centuries, that expansion is perceived as a threat. And the tension that gives rise to feeds uncertainty and potential uh, and actual conflicts, such as in eastern Ukraine uh, today. Many of us uh, who have been responsible for the foreign policy of Western countries have made huge efforts to restore relations with Moscow. And indeed, it reached a high point for me when I um, escorted President Putin around the London Olympics in 2012 and took him to the judo. He does judo and I do judo. We didn't play against each other at uh, judo, uh, but we watched Russians win gold medals. We drank a great deal of champagne. Uh, we exchanged all our judo terminology that baffled Prime Minister David Cameron when he joined in our conversation, that it was all in Japanese, it seemed. Um, and relations were at a very high point. But within a year, we had completely fallen out again uh, over events in Syria, and then within 18 months over Crimea and Ukraine. Having pushed the boulder up the hill, it rolled straight back down again. And that is the history 
repeated many times of our relations with Russia in recent years. So the end of the Cold War has brought new alliances and opportunities, but it's not brought to an end the hostile use of land forces in Europe itself. And at the same time, those processes of globalization, which I spoke about, are now bringing, it seems, the fragmentation of the West, a rise in populism and nationalism that is disruptive of international relations. Um, the CGS just spoke uh, about how elusive unity on strategy among Western countries seems to be, and this is quite correct. The G7 meeting two weeks ago broke up in the greatest disarray uh, of any uh, G7 meeting since it was invented and in our lifetimes, with other countries dumbfounded as to how they were meant to deal with relations with the President of the United States, rightly or wrongly, whatever point of view you take. On the Iran nuclear deal, which I had a part in uh, negotiating, we worked for years in close cooperation between Western allies and Russia and China to come to an agreement with Iran. And now we have the extraordinary sight of European foreign ministers sitting down with the foreign minister of Iran, essentially to work out ways of countering the decisions of the United States and policy of the United States. An extraordinary development from the perspective of anyone who has served as foreign secretary of the United Kingdom. There has been a major split between the United States and its European allies on important strategic issues with a NATO summit now uh, imminent. The United Kingdom's exit from the European Union is another aspect of that fragmentation, not primarily about security issues, but it is causing, creating an impact on security issues. Cooperation, for instance, on the Galileo satellite system, including its use for military uh, purposes, is jeopardized by the negotiations now taking place and could be uh, severely disrupted um, by um, any agreement or lack of agreement made between the United Kingdom and the European Union. The result of those negotiations could be, the overall result, could be close allies diminishing each other's security or making each other's security more expensive than it might otherwise uh, have been. And these developments are taking place just when alliances need updating to reflect the changed nature of politics and warfare. Uh, it is very clear from recent conflicts in Syria or in Ukraine uh, or between Israelis and Palestinians that successful military operations are now often closely related to social media operations and often accompanied by cyber operations. Indeed, there are accounts in some of these conflicts of military operations in support of social media operations rather than the other way around. Um, and uh, I think that it is very important to update uh, military thinking and concepts for that. I don't say so as an expert in any way on military affairs, um, but looking at the strategic position and how conflicts are now fought. I personally have advocated, for instance, that NATO needs a new concept of hybrid warfare urgently and an Article 5B addressing and allowing a collective response to hostile action in cyberspace, social media, conventional media, or with undeclared armed forces in a situation that is not declared war, but is definitely not peace uh, either. And armed forces in the 21st century will need to be part of the coordination of strategies across more dimensions than has ever been the case uh, before. Fighting terrorism is another example of that need. Terrorists are at a severe disadvantage in this world of uh, greater technology and information flows, but they are adept at finding asymmetric ways of using it for their own purposes. And social media allows a global franchise to be developed rapidly uh, for an international terrorist uh, organization. 
Um, uh, defeating them means winning over local populations, and that is critically important. So with every military maneuver, uh, it becomes a political maneuver as well, and many of you are thoroughly familiar with that. All of these factors are bringing greater uncertainty into world affairs. Um, and as Foreign Secretary in the UK, I found it was more useful to invest money in a crisis center that I could activate in the Foreign Office at half an hour's notice to deal with crises no one had predicted than it was to invest in more people predicting the next crisis. Capability and resilience was more important than perfect analysis of what was going to happen next. Uh, we had to deal with all the unpredictable events uh, of the, uh, what was initially called uh, the Arab Spring, uh, and effects of that are still going on. And it's important to add to this the recognition that we are living economically and financially in a relatively benign time in the world, and that will not go on forever. We can't forecast economics either, and indeed, nor can economists, as we well know. Uh, but we can bet from economic history that we're closer to the next recession than we are to the last one. And that will exacerbate uh, political problems. Further exacerbating them is unbalanced growth of the world's population. The United Nations expects the growth of half the growth of the world's population in the next 30 years to be in nine countries. There are around 200 countries in the world. Half the population growth is in nine of them. Uh, any understanding of the strategic context in the world means knowing which nine countries those are. Five of those are in Africa. And the doubling of the population of Africa and the Middle East in the next 30 years might fuel conflict, of course, uh, but above all, it threatens to overwhelm the unity and stability of Europe uh, through political reaction to increased migration flows, something we're seeing in uh, Italy, Germany, and other European countries at the moment. Now, I've mentioned the consequences of two of those three big changes in world affairs in our lifetimes. What of the third one, the rise of China? Overall, this is massively positive in world affairs. Hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. Now an engine, of the strongest engine of the world economy uh, overall. This has opened up many areas of strategic cooperation now and in the future with China. And the great challenge of relations with China is to manage a balance of competition and cooperation. But there will be competition. Uh, the speech of President Xi Jinping last October at the Chinese Communist Party Congress is the most important speech given in the world in recent years, and I recommend everyone to read it. It is three and a half hours long. It took three and a half hours to deliver, so reading it is the easy uh, option. Uh, but it is a most important speech, setting out the clear goals of China to 2035 and then to 2050, including by the middle of the century, world-class armed forces and leadership, global leadership in technology and including in artificial intelligence with a system of government quite distinct from the West and ready for adoption by other countries. Here we have the clue to the strategy of Kim Jong-un at the Singapore summit last week, seeking external security in order to then follow his own version of this model distinct from South Korea and distinct from Western uh, thinking of tight centralized party control and a more diversified economy uh, at the same time. So we can see in this thinking future strategic developments, but most of all, we can see a coming strategic race in artificial intelligence. And I believe that who is in the lead in the 2040s in AI will become as important as who was in the lead in the 1940s in developing the atomic bomb. And AI and cooperation between governments, military, and the private sector uh, will become a vital part of this strategic context. So it is a context, therefore, of unprecedented uh, progress in world affairs. 
including peace for the great majority of the world, uh, but nevertheless um, uh, bringing risks inherent in each of the driving forces behind globalization that has brought so many benefits in each of the three great drivers, there are new political and strategic uh, risks. Um, so uh, I believe it will be a time uh, of where it's vital to understand political and technological maneuver alongside military uh, maneuver. And I'm confident that the need for professional armed forces to have a strong understanding of this global strategic context and their own required capabilities, therefore, and the need to think in new dimensions will be necessary for a long time to come. I hope you'll be able to discuss these things and many other things uh, together, because discussing them together in a transparent forum um, is part of how we guard against fragmentation uh, and lack of unity and lack of clear thinking, uh, those things being considerable dangers to the conduct of world affairs. So I strongly welcome you here again uh, to this conference, and I hope you have a very successful couple of days. Thank you very much indeed.